point here when it comes to the results of this project on media councils in the digital age. We um, accomplished it with a lot of interesting results on surveys, on best practice, um, and we are very happy that we have you all here in all the experts, the main experts who, who have helped to make this um, project a success to have here and to have an exchange specifically with members of the European Parliament, but also other uh, stakeholders. I see um, colleagues from the publishers, from UNESCO and, and our other friends and stakeholders. So um, this is excellent news. Just for information, as I just said, we finished this first year project on media councils and we are very happy that we can announce already that we have the second year ahead of us with a continuation, but also with some new directions, which, which we will discuss hopefully also um, today. Um, the EFJ coordinated with the different consortium partners. I just mentioned them again. It was press or media councils from Ireland, from Finland, from Belgium, from Germany and from Austria, together with the two universities from Brussels and from Barcelona. And all this has been supported by the Alliance of Independent Press Councils of Europe, which of course has been very, very useful to also help the multiplier effect. Um, I will not say much, just two words, and that's trust is in all our, uh, our mouth when we talk about the future of journalism these days. And we also know that trust does not only depend on journalists and journalist contents. It depends on the larger framework, on the political players. We have seen, I don't have to mention them, enough of them these uh, last days. It depends on, on cultural issues and much more. But we think then one issue, and this is self-regulation and the issue of press and media councils has actually not <laughs> been enough in the, um, on, on, the, on the agenda when it comes to trust. I just uh, participated in a very interesting discussion led by the Reuters Institute uh, in Oxford. They are discussing indicators, as you all know, on, on digital journalism. And I actually asked, what about self-regulation? What about media councils? And they did admit, yes, it is important, but it has not yet been uh, discussed and researched by, by us enough. So I think there's also room for better cooperation from what comes from our results here to, to their results. And for that, we're also very happy that we have um, the universities, the academics um, here. But um, I would like now to, to introduce our first very small welcome. And we are very happy that we have MEPs. I will say a few words about them um, in a second. And first of all, I would like to give Audrius Perkauskas the word, the deputy head of unit on audiovisual and media services policies from the European Commission, from DG Connect, who has helped us make this event and this project possible. So thanks, um, Audrius, for a short welcome and introduction. Uh, thank you, Renate. Good morning, uh, colleagues. Uh, indeed, uh, let me say that we are proud of uh, this project uh, uh, because uh, not only it managed to achieve tangible results in this uh, rather difficult year marked by the COVID pandemic, uh, but also the nature of the results uh, is, is varied and all the results are very pertinent to today's uh, media environment. Uh, because this project combines uh, different uh, types of deliverables. Uh, in particular, it uh, supports uh, establishment of uh, media councils or, uh, in those countries which do not have uh, media councils yet. Uh, not to, not let's say, not in all countries which miss media councils currently, because of course uh, the money is uh, necessarily limited. But step by step, the project will expand the family of media councils in Europe, and uh, this is uh, extremely valuable. Then there is uh, the networking element, bringing all the 
councils together to exchange practices and to collaborate online. And then what I noted is, of course, uh, uh, a very interesting uh, element of research into new areas of, uh, of media, like automated news delivery, which is extremely pertinent uh, in today's environment. So uh, going from the project to the wider political context, um, I would mention just a couple of points. One is that uh, uh, we look at uh, media councils uh, and the presence of media councils in the context of rule of law report because the Commission recognizes that media councils uh, are important part of uh, media uh, freedom and pluralism, uh, let's call it infrastructure in Europe. So in the first uh, rule of law report, the Commission uh, mentioned uh, uh, the, the existence of media councils in a number of member states and the conditions for their activities. Um, and indirectly, media councils feature also in uh, the Commission's uh, democracy action plan because one of the action areas of, of that plan is to stimulate exchange between um, media self-regulatory bodies and come up with uh, possible recommendations how to strengthen uh, media pluralism in Europe. So as you see, all in all, Media councils are our partners across uh, different uh, activities, be it project work or policy initiatives. And uh, uh, this is why I welcome very much with this exchange and, uh, and look forward to continue working with you in the second year of the project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Audrius, to put it all in a context, very rightly so. Are oh, you still talking? I hear you still talking, but anyway, um, putting it in a context also with regard to the rule of law, which of course is very important and a very good link to um, welcome our three ladies, um, MEPs. Um, I would like to first um, give the word to Petra Kama-Ewert, who had some problems with, uh, with her internet. I hope it will work. Just to give you a brief, Petra Kama-Ewert is vice chair of the group of Progressive Alliance and Socialist Democrats. She has been very active in the Culture Committee for years, for years. She has also been active um, in Germany, um, in the Broadcasting Council of the Public Service Broadcaster. So this issue is very known to her. She was the rapporteur on behalf of the Culture Committee on the Digital Service Act. So all these issues are very known to her. Um, dear Petra, are you all right? Can you, can you give us a, a few introducing words? Yes, no. <laughs> I see Thomas, her assistant, who doesn't look happy. Hmm. Well, then we wait for Petra. Maybe we can um, hear her in a second. Then I would give the floor to um, Alexandra, hoping that Petra will be with us in a two minutes. Alexandra, um, you are from the Greens, actually, and you also have been very busy both on the rule of law, but also on a, you have been a, a rapporteur of the opinion on the framework of ethical aspects on artificial intelligence. So I'm sure you are specifically interested in the issue of news automation and um, what press councils have, if they have a say in that or not. So please, uh, I'm very happy to give you the word. Yeah, th thank you very much for, for inviting me here to speak to this distinguished audience. This is really a great opportunity for me. I'm very grateful. Um, I would like more to focus on, not on the media councils, because I'm not an expert on that, um, but on my role as a shadow rapporteur for the Digital Services Act, which can have um, great implications also for media. And um, this is what I would like to talk about um, more today, those aspects. 
And I would like to say that as a citizen, I'm, and as a shadow rapporteur for the digital services sector, I'm acutely aware of the importance of quality media and the recent developments in journalism as well, that are all very closely connected to the dynamics of social media. And I think we have all seen that in the past days in Washington and what happened to, to capital, what disinformation, what kind of damage disinformation can do to a vibrant democracy like the American one and what the role of journalism is there. So I'm, first of all, I would like to thank you all for your very de dedicated work under such increasingly difficult conditions. And there are two points I would like to make today, and that might seem a little bit off topic at first sight, but Renate mentioned trust and the larger framework in the beginning, so I'm totally convinced they're not because the future of your profession is based on credibility on the one hand, but also on a financially viable model on the other. And the viability of that financial model has been attacked by Facebook and Google's business model, which is based on targeted advertising. So advertising not based on context as it used to be, but on tracking citizens online and offline and using that kind of very private information to target ads to them. And 98% of the revenue of Facebook and 70% of the revenue of Google stems from that model. The problem is we have the chance to ban this model in the DSA and to um, prepare the path that advertising money can go back to quality media outlets. One of the problems that we have that not only Google and Facebook are against that for obvious reasons, but also a lot of European publishers are against that because they have been obliged to rely for part of their own funding on tracking advertising, on targeted advertising as well. And some publishers have their own interests in that area because they have invested in that activity. So I'm convinced that um, we need to ban targeted advertising in order to come back to reduce disinformation because you know Facebook's model is to, um, to focus on, and Google's as well on YouTube on polarizing content which is harmful for our democracy. And if we want to get rid of this huge disinformation problem, we have to ban that kind of business models. So we have the chance to do that within the digital services act. And I think we need to do it in order to curb disinformation and hateful speech and to uh, bring advertising money flows back to quality media outlets. And I would really ask you to look into this aspect, to look into the financial aspects of your work. And if you are convinced to get in touch with us and to support the campaign that we will have in order to ban targeted advertising, get more money back to quality media outlets. There's a short second point I would like to make, and this is drawing really on the, your experience with media councils. I have been proposing the idea of social media councils because we have seen in the last days how difficult it is, who is going to make the decision if a sitting American president's Twitter account or Facebook account can be blocked or not. I, I don't think it is acceptable in a democracy that it, it's, they had the CEO of a monopolistic corporation to take that decision. And whether we are in favor of that decision or not, you know, that you can have different opinions on that. And we might be happy with this decision now, but it's totally not acceptable that it's, it's just the CEO of a corporation to take that decision. What is not acceptable as well, that we can't just copy the media council because media councils are self-regulatory bodies by the industry. But if you have an oligopolistic industry with basically three or four corporations, you can't do that because they will never attack their own business models. So what I'm proposing together with David Kay, the former UN Rapporteur for Free Speech and, and other people, free speech advocates, are social media councils made up by civil society, a representation of experts for freedom of speech by media, academia, but also the minorities targeted by hateful speech or women's organizations strongly targeted by hateful speech. Therefore, I would like you to ask, ask you to help us with that idea. You have all that experience from um, the media councils. How can we enrich that idea? How can we put it forward in order to create a better information and media environment for everybody? Thank you very much. And I wish you- Excellent. This. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you very much. I think two very important issues, of course, viability and also the issue of social media council, which, by the way, will be much more focused in our second part. So I'm sure we will come back to you and discuss with you. Now I would like to introduce Ramona, who had some problems, family problems, and I'm even more happy that she is taking the time to be with us. 
uh, Ramona Strugario. She is the vice chair of Renew and she has been working in the Liebe Committee, also very um, busy with the rule of law, a member of the media group and the shadow rapporteur on strengthening media freedom, disinformation and hate speech. So Ramona, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Happy New Year, everybody. Thank you for the invitation and very happy to honor it and honored to be in such a um, company. Yes, an emergency call from, from the school of my son. Things are still ongoing. So um, I would, I would uh, pass on my message and with you apologies. Uh, I, I must leave afterwards because I don't, I'm not sure how things will evolve. So I may as well um, uh, have to, uh, to, to, to head to the hospital afterwards. But um, briefly, let me first congratulate um, IFIJ for this pilot project um, and I'm happy to hear that the, the, the initiative will continue because it is a tremendous need uh, um, for, for media health and for democracy health overall um, for such projects. And um, I truly welcome that, uh, that under the new Creative Europe program, um, and I'm talking about the, the 2021-2027 framework, we uh, have money specifically dedicated to, to journalists and journalistic projects, but I actually hope that with the use of pilot projects and the diversification of pilot projects, um, uh, we will actually be able to identify even more uh, sources of financing uh, um, and, and continue the, to, 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 to research and, and develop uh, new, new tools for navigating through the, the digital age. Now, we, we have seen what the, the, the pandemic and the associated infogamic, infogamic gave us lately and how they uh, amplify tremendously the, the defamation crisis. Uh, not that we uh, hadn't had the issue before, we did have it, we were not maybe able to see it as clearly as, clearly as we have uh, uh, seen it um, today. Um, and I believe that under these circumstances, media literacy and media literacy projects and tools can literally save lives. And we have seen it with, certain, um, with, with a certain impact that the disinformation had in a, a number of states. Um, it is vital that people are equipped with the right tools to, um, to allow them to identify credible news and stories and to enhance their critical thinking uh, in order uh, to distinguish fact from uh, fake. It is also uh, vital that such information reaches people because uh, we have the problem of, of high quality information and, and news and then we have the problem of how far this type of information and news uh, reaches uh, in deep state. Um, and, and we have uh, seen uh, lately many examples where apparently it does not reach, whereas uh, the boring truth uh, has a limited uh, area of expansion, fake news roll up and, and, and they reach communities about six times faster. Uh, this is the reality that we are confronted uh, uh, with. Um, then, um, I, I believe that this type of uh, uh, projects and particularly uh, media councils and well-functioning media councils play, play a crucial role in, in promoting highly trained journalists. And this is an, an issue that um, at least in a number of uh, member states, maybe including mine, uh, we have been uh, confronted uh, uh, with. We need to set up the bar uh, really high in terms of ethical standards in journalism, um, probably now more than ever, and to consider this. Uh, also with uh, consistent financial support, I would say, for this type of, uh, of training. Um, yes, self-regulation for the profession creates a stronger and a more independent media. Certain countries and certain media councils um, in, in, in some countries need to learn how to do this. And I have seen, uh, I have seen um, such media councils, including the one in my country, maybe strongly politicized at some point, maybe not as efficient as it, they, they should at some point, maybe lost to some point because they didn't know exactly how to, 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 to address it. Um, then with, with, with uh, uh, respect to regaining trust in media, um, I, I would also like to mention that we should be very careful about creating automated tools that select certain uh, material based on digital indicators um, because such solutions can turn to some point against uh, us um, 
the let's think that hackers and, and fake news content creators breach the technical mechanisms behind the solutions. So what happens next? Next, well, a bit of a chaos. Algorithms cannot tell apart truth from fact. We always have to remember that they can only recognize man-made markers. And unless we are absolutely sure uh, about the safety of those markers, I believe uh, uh, it is dangerous and great care should be considered when moving ahead. And then last but not least, because my colleague already addressed DSA and DMA, I'm looking forward to the, to the final products and we will make our contribution there as well, about ethics and, and, and journalists in general. I would like to address this from a very clear political perspective, because we always talk about citizens, but we, we, we tend not to talk about politicians. And here, I think there are two key words um, that we always have to, uh, uh, to bear in mind, uh, uh, facilitate and refrain from political perspective. And when I see facilitate, I, I speak about access to information. And I have seen how, and we have seen how certain governments addressed this and, and, and provided access to information uh, for journalists during the crisis. Um, I, we have seen how they addressed uh, the request for, for access to in, uh, information, and I must say that in certain states, member states, this was a bit disastrous uh, because the tendency was to, 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 to uh, instead of facilitating and communicating to refrain and restrain access, access to information, this is extremely dangerous. Um, uh, then then um, th there are countries, uh, including mine, who have which have strong legislation on, on access to, 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 to information, but that, that legislation is not respected by the, the public institutions and by the politicians. Um, and, and this should happen definitely everywhere, not only in specific countries, but everywhere. Um, so um, if, if someone really wants, and politicians really want to, uh, to do something useful for directly for ethics and, and journalists, they, they should on the one hand facilitate this access to information, but refrain from directly investing financially in media to turn it into a political tool. Uh, because another aspect is how politicians always are tempted and tend to use and instrumentalize uh, uh, media for their own political purposes. And this again is a, a, a big problem, I think, for, for trust of citizens and journalists and quality journalism and, and, and for for the quality and, uh, of information as well, not to talk about investigative journalism always has to suffer uh, um, because of that. And, and every time a, a team of investigative journalists reveals a very important information related to a politician, uh, politicians are upset and then certain uh, uh, medias would, would uh, comment and interpret maybe uh, in a direction defending that politician. I, as a politician, said that, that, that media should stop defending politicians because uh, this is not the role of, 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 of media. Media should simply speak the truth and, and reveal what it is to be, regardless of who's in, who's in power. Uh, but then I'm, I'm per, per, per speaking about ourselves that we should truly refrain from, from, from trying to use the information in such a way. These are uh, my, my comments looking forward to, to elaborating on this later on as well, uh, using some of uh, the excellent, excellent conclusions uh, further on in, in, in uh, uh, building good practice on, on this, because this is how we, we build up democracy and how we strengthen uh, democracy. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Ramona. You said it all, um, and it's all very important. And you see in the program, we will be discussing uh, media literacy, of course, ethical standards is top. And also in the next project, there is specific money allocated for new press councils, because you're right, the ones we are here as our consortium partners, they're doing well. But in many countries, we have rather very bad or no media councils at all. And um, I know you have done, been doing a lot on, on journalism and safety of journalists. And I would also like to say, since there have been so many problems regarding safety of journalists and when it comes to demonstrations and relation to the police, many press councils have asked for a better understanding of the role of journalism vis-a-vis -vis police and vis-a-vis -vis civil society. But as time is running, thank you, Ramona, and, and, and good luck with you also on your personal side. And um, I hope Petra now is with us and uh, we are happy to listen to you.
Petra, does it work? Petra? Hello. Yes. Uh, not so good. Okay, I, I, I try to uh, on my speech, and if you cannot hear me because of that, of that connection, please give me any kind of time. So, uh, dear, dear Renate, dear colleagues, dear participants, thank you for the invitation. I think this is a very crucial and important issue we have to discuss today. And uh, I think it's hard to conceive of the European press and media landscape without press and media council. They act as a guide and ethical compass, but also as a vocal lobby against state intervention with the aim to safeguard the independent press and media. It is the structure and nature that is key to the role press and media councils play, which can be troublesome uh, at times, but in the end, it's made effective and balanced by the integration of civil societies. What is more, the independence, independence and non-governmental organization are fundamental in order to fulfill the task as a critical observer, guardians of independence and for monitoring the fulfillment of the program mandate. This is a way in order to guarantee for plurality and diversity a broad range of social interests must be involved in this press and media council. As I see it, plurality and diversity are not only goals per se, but form and basis for the satisfactory outputs. In the revised audiovisual media service directive, uh, directive, which came into force in 2019, a special concern of mine was therefore to look to legally anchor the non-governmental and independent status of the members of these councils. In the past, we often had to conclude that these demands are not met in practice. Here, we wanted to remedy the situation, and time will tell us if adjustment uh, will be needed in the future. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic poses not only a global health crisis, but also a critical moment providing how small the dividing line between public trust and distrust toward the press and media. And supposedly, between truth and famous at the same age. Here and now, can deliver doing fact based and emotional reporting so needed to build trust in the work of researchers and fields experts from around the world. And yes, by always raising their critical voices where measures taken in the usual community. Examples like this demonstrate us to us in the digital work of journalists, where in a professional speaker, in audiovisual media, private or public or grassroots internet blog is not getting any easier. This makes it all the more essential to uphold journalistic standards as independence, pluralism, pluralism, and of course, quality and truthfulness. These standards set decent journalism, good press and media apart from others. Hence, the work of Press and Media Council is indispensable for maintaining the character and quality of the European media landscape, and they work to ensure that quality criteria are maintained in press reporting. In this respect, digital tools naturally offer a chance for the impact of Press and Media Council's work as they can, for example, greatly improve the possibilities for and participation of citizens to report inappropriate media coverage, but also make these processes, processes more transparent to everyone. Many journalists take their daily work to point out the inept process uh, of self-regulation, for example, in business, and to inform the public about shortcomings to shake up and so on. We can draw from this that safe regulation is always the most credible and achieves the best results when it's fully internalized and consistently practiced by those who impose these rules on themselves. Yet, we also know that those who simply pass over criticism again and again 
eventually lose debt. As a new EU parliamentary, I'm naturally keen to take away something tangible from a project of this, uh, of this kind for our own legislative work, but I will keep this brief. On the one hand, we must be sure that the press and media in all member states and beyond can do their jobs absolutely freely, and in particular, where we already know that freedom of the press, the rule of law, and the independence of uh, Judy Carey are being undermined. To this end, I believe it would be useful to set up additional funding instruments and European projects, especially those tailored to support the local press and media. And on the other hand, we need to push forward political efforts for critical media education from European level and provide European citizens with the necessary digital skills and tools. And therefore, I am now looking forward to the today's discussion and of course also to the results of the pilot project and hope we will see more pilot projects like this in the future. Thank you very much and uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Petra. I think it got better and better, the quality. Thank you very much for, for stressing the importance of independent and um, transparent self-regulation, which indeed is so important for the trustworthiness for the press. And you also mentioned the specific situation in COVID. Interestingly enough, or maybe not interesting enough, there had been less complaints when it came to COVID reporting. Um, and I think that's very important to notice, as we know, many people are more and more against journalists these days. So, yes, you also um, discussed the issue of digital funding and, and other very important issues. Um, thank you for that. Um, since time is running, I will now immediately go to our panel and thank all our MEPs again for their very insightful contributions and for their interest and continued interest and for being with us and possibly also sharing in the q a afterwards some more questions um, our panel is called media self-regulation in europe a model to protect media freedom and encourage professionalism in journalistic ethics in the digital world it sounds very good we have three, four distinguished experts and I'm happy to start with Ricardo Gutierrez, my dear colleague, um, the General Secretary of the European Federation of Journalists, who has also been himself active in the French-speaking Belgian Press Council. So you know what you're talking about, Ricardo. You also know what's at stake, having the European overview and um, having been the coordinator of this project. So tell us, what do we need um, in, in five minutes, Max, uh, regaining trust in media? How okay. can we get there? It's a challenge. I'll be short, uh, Renato. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, and thank you, thank you for taking part uh, in, in this discussion on, on a subject that is extremely important, as you said, Renato, for the credibility of the, of the media. Um, I, as you have understood, um, our project, our EU project, aims to, to adapt uh, journalistic self-regulation to, to the challenges of the digital age. And uh, I should say that we are very proud of this uh, project, of this European model of, of journalistic uh, self-regulation, which uh, will contribute, I think, to, to the development of uh, uh, quality journalism and, and which also contributes to, to the fight against uh, disinformation. Um, for, for the first time ever, uh, an EU pilot project brings together the, the energies uh, of the representative organization of journalists, the EFJ, the European Press Councils and two universities, as you said, Renate, and um, uh, the European Commission, and, and uh, in particular DigiConnect, uh, whom I thank, uh, has stressed us for, for, for a first one year project. The same project will continue to work on, on, on the same topic this year. Um, 
what are the challenges uh, for, for the project uh, partners? Uh, first of all, making press councils better known uh, to the public. That's the first challenge, helping uh, to resolve confidence as well, uh, confidence in the media by pushing them to, to respect uh, ethical principles. Um, and helping to create, as you, as you said, Renate, new press councils where they do not yet exist. Um, the speakers uh, who follow me will present some of the very concrete results uh, already achieved, such as how to respond to, to the rise of robot journalism, the problem of automated uh, content production, how to better educate young people about the media, uh, how young journalists perceive uh, professional ethics. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm not going to be long, but I, I would like to stress uh, the strong commitment of journalist organizations, uh, which have often been at the origin uh, of the creation of press councils. Um, as the representatives of the profession, I, I can assure you that uh, we strongly defend uh, professional ethics. Uh, in our view, uh, press councils are an essential tool to promote responsible journalism, credible and trustworthy journalism. Now, um, the situation is rather worrying. Uh, trust in, in the news has fallen in, in most uh, countries since, since uh, 2015. Just, just to give you some figures, in Germany, uh, the proportion that trusts the most news most of the time has fallen from 60% in 2015 to 47% in 2019. In Finland, the, the figure uh, has dropped from 68% to 59%. The, these are just a few figures uh, to indicate the, the, the seriousness, I would say, of, of the situation. And, and it's not just about the media. Um, what happened uh, a few days ago in, in the United States is very worrying. Um, and it's not the degenerates who invaded the, the capital that worries me. Uh, what worries me is what has mobilized them, the lies, the so-called alternative facts, the, the, the systematic distortion of uh, reality, the mistrust against institution, against uh, science, against those in power, against the media. Uh, we all know that this global mistrust, as uh, Hannah Arendt uh, wrote so well, is the breeding ground for totalitarian regime. So at a time when, when we most need professional journalists and reliable information to counter this information, public confidence in the media is declining. Why is it? Uh, academic research showed that people's perception of journalism and the news media is deeply influenced by their perception of other institutions. Uh, Richard Fletcher from Reuters Institute, you already mentioned Reuters Institute, Renate. Um, Richard Fletcher says that if trust in political institutions falls, then trust in the news media is dragged down with it. And if the political situation becomes more polarized, even the best news coverage can come to be seen as biased by large sections of the population. What we need to regain trust is to do our job properly as journalists. Uh, people expect us to report in, in, in a timely uh, manner helping citizens to, to understand the world around them and, and holding power uh, into account. To account. Uh, Richard Fletcher says that people with low trust in the news media uh, don't want it to, to be fundamentally different. They just want it to be better. In other words, uh, what we need urgently is stronger journalism, deeper journalism, better journalism. Uh, we in the FJ have always believed that this information is not fouled with uh, anti-fake news laws or other provisions that will limit freedom of expression. We, we consider that the best antidote to this information is quality journalism, stronger journalism, ethical journalism, of course, media literacy for all, 
media pluralism, and, and above all, a policy of increased transparency uh, of, of those in, in power. The most transparency there is in, in public affairs, the less disinformation there is. We also believe that uh, journalists have a role to play, of course. Uh, they, they, they too must be, be more transparent in, in, in their work. They must take more account of the public interest. They must be more careful, uh, more careful that, than ever before to respect uh, ethical rules. And that is, that is why we must support self-regulation and press councils. Any other strategy can be dangerous. Uh, that is why we are against uh, projects uh, that aim to certify uh, the media, to, to label them as credible media or not non-credible uh, media. W what we need uh, is to give citizens the skills to, to see for themselves which information is credible or not. Uh, press councils are one such tool. They are pluralist and independent and all work for the benefit of citizens. The press council is an instrument fundamentally at the service of civil society. We believe that journalists are increasingly aware of the need to respect ethics in order to regain the trust of citizens. Once again, we, we, we thank the European Commission for helping us to, to consolidate this tool at the service of, of citizens, uh, at the service of respect for the truth, which is, uh, I believe, more needed than ever before. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you very much for some very interesting insights. I think you're absolutely right. We are at a crossroads at the moment and the happenings in the United States with the so-called mob um, entering democratic institutions, the police letting them in, all that based on conspiracies and lies shows the incredible challenge we face because these mobs are part of the citizens, are part of the people we have to get back to. And media councils, of course, is one way, like audience engagement, we mentioned more and more when it comes to journalism, to, to try to engage them. And we know it's very difficult because we are living in an ever more polarized society. But that's why also media literacy is so important, to which we, we talk a little bit later. So a lot of food for thought. Thank you very much. And um, I would like now to represent Lauri Hapanen, who is a lecturer in Finland. And I think I cannot pronounce the name of the university. Jyväskylä. I hope the University of um, Jyväskylä. To make it better, Lauri, thank you very much. We have had you already a little while ago. You addressed the, th the theme of news automation and self-regulation with our digital expert group, and it had been very interesting. So just before I give you the floor, you know there is also a chat item. I hadn't mentioned it. We all know there is a Q&A afterwards, but since there are a lot of people talking at the moment, if you have any questions, I would open the floor after Lauri, because before we get to the other two speakers, so we do not have too much talk, just let me know and I'll give you the floor afterwards. So now I'm very, very happy to, to welcome Lauri and give us some insights from the north, where very often things are a bit more advanced, more transparent. Um, in, for us, still a subject which is rather complicated and new, also dealing with algorithms. We also ask for more transparency, but sometimes we do not even know exactly what you ask for. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you very much. I will share some slides with you. Let's see if this works now. Can you see my slides now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Here's, here's our, the title of our research that we've done here in Finland, Media Councils in the Emerging Era of News Automation. So we really wanted to help Media Councils and, and figure out how they should or should they already somehow respond to the news automation, the use of algorithms, algorithms and personalization and this kind of issues. And in a nutshell, we have these three research questions. First, we figured out 
or I conducted this research, so maybe I can say that I figured out how media councils has responded news automation in their guidelines, in their code of codes of ethics in on European level and more widely on universally too. Then second research question is what is the present state of the art in news automation? And finally, what kind of self-regulatory actions these the state of the art might call for. So I went the results quickly through and we have, as mentioned, published our report some month ago. So there are more details, more details about the data who we have interviewed and, and, and our results are, are more elaborated there. But first about something about the guidelines, there's not so much to say. I went through some 500 guidelines, not only on a European press count, from European press councils, but worldwide, and almost nothing came up. So there is no uh, news automation algorithms, and this kind of keywords are not mentioned in the ethical, uh, in the code of ethic yet. However, media councils are, we can say that they are waiting and watching. Here's one quote from one chair of a, of a one, media, uh, one European media council. And he said that news automation is more or less non-existent in their media market and also personalization is very rare. However, about one third of the respondents said that they have already discussed on some level about the challenges that news automation and personalization and use of algorithms may bring. So it's more interesting then to figure out what is the state of the art of news automation at the moment. And I think here we have to begin by defining what we mean by news automation. One definition is that it, it refers to all kinds of algorithmic tools that can facilitate the journalistic work, some part of the journalistic work, for example, making alerts to journalists, journalists that there is something newsworthy happening, facilitating, gathering or analyzing of material, it can help in transcribing, proofreading, editing photos, and so on, A-B testing, distributing content, and so on. And these kind of uh, algorithmic tools are already quite widely in use in European media houses and media outlets. But I think we can possibly argue that in these solutions, there's always the human component involved in this process, more or less, and that ensures that ethical requirements are met. So in, this, in my research and in this report, I'm more interested in the second kind of news automation that I named full-blooded news automation that refers to news robots that independently handles the entire process from selecting the topic gathering information, analyzing what to, to write in the article, and then write the, write the text in human language and publish it without human intervention. And here, what I find out is that algorithms, algorithms already make lots of news about weather, sports, elections, finals, financial reports, and so on domains. But at the moment, these current applications are actually more modest than the hype around them. We are talking quite a lot about news automation, but these real solutions are not on so high level. Here are a couple of quotes from software developers. They, for example, say that, that they are not doing at the moment or in the near future any editorials, but instead their systems, their news automation systems, they are making quite basic data-driven and highly repetitive content that scales to many dimensions. And other software developer pointed out that their systems use exactly the same data sets as human journalists. They are not scraping information from internet, but they are using data sets that some, some human has, has first quality, quality said, said that this is quality data, you can use it. So it's not so secret or shadow process at all. And basically, what is the 
state of the art or where the news automation is used mostly at the moment is, is some specific visual or numerical parts of an article, for example, infographics, and then the read more recommendations, that is these lists in the end of the stories that are based on the user's online behavior and also some information that the user has entered to the, to the software. So my conclusion in this report is that there's maybe not an urgent need for guidance, but at the same time, we must keep our eyes open. And why we should do that, I have four points. One is that media councils actually do not have a comprehensive picture of what's going on. And that's mainly because, as I found out, it was extremely difficult to get answers from large media operators. They just didn't answer my questionnaires which were very personalized questioners, but they, they didn't answer. And one colleague of mine said that, that that's because big number of texts are already produced automatically, but publishers want to keep quiet because people are, are afraid of this kind of automated content. And that's why they don't want to reveal what they are doing now or what are their future plans. Then, there are things happening in the field of journalism and of course innovations can spill over, so to say, from nearby industries, especially because the same software developers that make news automation systems, these news automation systems are only one part of their business and not the biggest part, but they also do online marketing and these kind of other domains. And for example, personalization is much more common in online marketing than in journalism. So it can spill over from there to journalism quite easily, I would say. And then the four point, I, I quote there this quite famous futurological phrase that the effect of technological progress is often overestimated in a short run, as we often do when we have this hype up about news automation. We have talked about it several decades and there's not so concrete solutions yet. But then this Amaras law goes on saying that, that we tend to underestimate this progress in the long run. And I think that's one point why we should really keep our eyes open. And that's why I, in this report, I added, identified three points that we must not overlook when we discuss news automation. First of all, that data has so far been the bottleneck in the development because these news automation systems really need systematic numerical data sets. But in, in research, there's a lot of work going on. And researchers and, and software developers try to find out ways to utilize new types of data sets, preformed texts, audio files, video files, and so on. And once they can do that, we can take a leap forward in news automation. But these kind of data sets cannot usually be produced within newsroom, but it requires that we have a collaboration between several experts from many different fields. And this takes us to the sec second point, that is agency, that these software developers really need to internalize their role as part of this editorial production chain no matter are they integral part, in integral part of the editorial team or are they external designers and, and the media only buys the system or purchase the system from outside or produce it in-house, no, no matter, but they really don't need to understand that they are part of this production chain. And therefore they need to adhere to a journalistic value base and the third point, point is transparency. In a research, there's, it's often mentioned that transparency is the key in maintaining and also restoring the trusting relationship, relationship between news media operators and their audience. So I think we must be transparent in the use of algorithms, news automation, personalization, and this kind of solutions. And finally, it is this transparency is a good way to differentiate journalistic media from social media giants. 
who are often not so transparent in about the information they are gathering and how they are exploiting this information. So I conclude by saying here and in my report that media councils should monitor carefully the development on the field of news automation, what's going on there. They should ensure that they offer real, a realistic opportunity for the audience to complain because quite often the procedures at the moment are so strict that it's, it can be complicated or nearly impossible for audience to complain, for example, about news automation and personalization, which are uh, issues that you really, or aspects that you really cannot easily see if they are taking place or not. So this takes, takes us to this third point that media councils should be sensitive to silent signals and really in, act on their own initiative, not waiting for complaints, but act on their own initiative. And, and my final, final line here is, or claim is that if the media councils do not take the lead in regulation of news automation, perhaps someone else will do it and be it national legislators, the EU or platform, platform companies, this could put the freedom of the press in jeopardy, perhaps. But yeah, thanks for listening to me and, and the report. You can find it from, the, from this website. And if you have any other comments later on, don't hesitate to contact me. Here's my email address. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Lauri. If you get rid of the, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think this has been a most useful insight in news automation. Um, could you try? Um, sorry, just. Um, you're trying to get it out. Anyway, um, yes, I think we. It just shows how important it is to deal with the issue. You said that news automation is not yet done for the editorial, but I'm sure this will be rather quicker than later. Um, and it's very, very important, as you rightly say, that the media councils deal with the issue and not anybody else. So I'm also very happy that the Alliance of Independent Press Councils of Europe is listening to that and dealing with that. And maybe what's been done already now in Finland is already done in other countries as well, but that this exchange is so urgent. And for that, I'm very happy that we we have the second part um, of, of the project to deal with that much more. Um, as I said before, I don't see in the chat, but anybody has a specific question now to Lauri or to Ricardo? I mean, there's a lot of food for thought. There's a lot of information you gave also question of data. I found very interesting that software developments, developers need to adhere to journalistic standards. I don't know if that has been happening already, but that's also for the EFJ something to deal with. Um, any question? Yes, Alexandra? If I may, very shortly, because I'm very interested in the topic, because I sit on the AI committee in Parliament as well, I'm the coordinator there for my party. Um, who are the companies that are developing the systems, the algorithm and so on, and what kind of oversight or um, control do you have in order to ensure transparency? Just very briefly. Lauri, you are muted. Yes, now I'm no, not. Okay, yeah, these companies are, for example, AX Semantics, United Robots, uh, and uh, Narrativa. These are European companies that are doing, among other things, news automation systems and then selling their products and these systems to, to media operators. These names are mentioned in this re my report, and I just put the, the link to this report to the chat so you can find the names and the CEOs I interviewed from this report. Excellent. Any other questions? 
because otherwise then we move on to another issue which we already discussed and which is very important, the issue of media literacy specifically for the youth in the age of disinformation. We all use these challenges and I'm very happy to have Alexander Varchilek, the chairman of the Austrian Press Councils, to give us some more insights. Um, Alexander, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Renate. As you just mentioned, and uh, as you mentioned already before, media literacy is a key factor for strengthening our democracy, but also for strengthening the trust and the credibility in professional media. So I was very happy to be able together with uh, the German Press Council to develop this kind of a media literacy toolkit for teachers and schools. Uh, so the whole story is based on nine different uh, cases, cases that uh, have been decided by various uh, European press councils. Four uh, countries have been involved, besides Austria and Germany, also Finland, uh, Switzerland and uh, Belgium, so it's, it's five countries. And um, we created this kind of uh, role plays based on these decisions um, from the press councils. And of course, for the tactical purpose, uh, we had to change uh, the cases slightly, but um, generally speaking, they are very close uh, to the decisions the press councils made. And uh, besides these uh, nine case studies and role plays, the toolkit consists also of uh, two um, explanatory videos. One video is uh, about uh, discrimination and our anti-discrimination clauses in the uh, professional code of ethics of, of the press councils. And the second video is about the correct um, reporting on suicide coverage. And um, we, we will continue with the role plays with the cases this year. We try to get uh, new cases. Uh, we put weight on cases which are on decisions which have been related uh, to topics uh, which are of interest for young people. So some of the cases involved also young people. And uh, besides that, we tried also to be very topical. So it was a mix of being topical and of having um, topics um, connected to, to young people, to the group of young people. And this year we are also trying to go to schools and promote those role plays and cases. So the idea is um, that um, representatives from various press councils will travel to other countries and present that role plays and play the role plays with the students uh, just to, to promote it a bit more. And uh, we are also trying to contact uh, ministries for education and schools uh, to, to yeah, put uh, some, some light uh, on, on our toolkit, which is, it, it, it is quite, quite interesting, I think. And also the, the feedback uh, from, from the other press councils involved in the alliance of, uh, of the press councils was very good. They said uh, that the cases are very practical and, uh, and nice. So I'm, I'm happy to, to, uh, to promote it also this year and to continue with this project. We are also planning to do two more explanatory videos. So I think um, the package is quite nice. Maybe we should work a little bit on the promotion now. Thank you very 
much, um, Alexander. Interesting indeed, and I think it would be really good to get this information out. I know there are many other groups like lie detectors and other, others who are dealing with journalism in schools at national level, at international level, and the more we can share the experience, the better. So any information you have, we have it already on the Press Council's EU website, but maybe we can even disseminate it more and then of course go deeper in, in the second part. Um, it's been in very interesting and, and actually quite positive. Um, are there any specific questions? Because otherwise we will just give the floor now, last not, but not least to David Domingo. And afterwards we have some more comments and questions and answers. Um, David, I'm very happy that you will talk a little bit more generally about the survey, the, um, the university, the ULB, University Libre of Brussels did when it comes to media councils and the perceptions of them but also to discuss a little bit specifically on young journalists and what their ethical challenges are in 2021. Um, thank you, David. Yes, I, I actually will, will present two, uh, two different uh, projects that have been done in the context of, the, of this uh, project. Uh, the, the survey was uh, coordinated by our colleagues in Barcelona by Blanc Kerna and we together uh, designed the questions and they address journalists and members of press councils, also uh, uh, CEOs of uh, media companies. But I, I will focus on very uh, a specific uh, uh, few of the highlights of that, of that survey. And then uh, the results of uh, the focus groups we did in Belgium uh, with uh, students had, who had recently been interns in news media companies uh, and who had the first practical uh, uh, challenges with dealing with the ethics they were learning in the journalism schools. I'll try to share my screen if that works. Uh, voila. Uh, so uh, first uh, in, in line, uh, this is a study conducted by my colleagues uh, Pere Massif, Jaume Suau and Carlos Ruiz. Jaume is uh, around us, uh, with us to, today, and I will, I must uh, tell you, I will have to leave soon after uh, the presentation, so if there is questions, I, I will kindly ask uh, Jama to, to, to take them. Um, this, uh, this survey uh, covered, uh, on one hand, 450 journalists in nine European countries and 61 members of press councils in six European countries. And uh, from in, on the first side, uh, the journalists, they, um, uh, when we ask them if they know uh, the code of ethics, you can see uh, in the screen that uh, there is uh, a vast majority of the journalists who are confident to say uh, they know well or very well uh, the code of ethics in their country or more generally the, the code of ethics proposed by the Federation of Journalists. And, and the difference by age or gender are not uh, very significant. Uh, main, main, maybe what is most interesting is that the young people between 26 and 35, if uh, you allow me to call them young, uh, they, they are the ones who are a bit more self-critical about their knowledge of uh, the code of ethics. Uh, this contrasts with the perspective of members of the uh, press councils, uh, because they uh, think that the knowledge of uh, the code of ethics by journalists is good, but as you see, the, the central column, the one that says it's, uh, may, it, it's they know the code of ethics, but the knowledge of rules uh, may be limited, uh, is a bit bigger than in the case of the journalists. And also that changes uh, between, uh, between countries uh, and uh, it's Ireland and Finland where there is more, uh, yeah, they are more sure, more uh, reassured that the journalists uh, know well their co codes of ethics. And in other countries, uh, the members of the press councils are, are a, bit, uh, a bit more uh, critical about that. Uh, we asked as well the journalists whether they knew the, of the existence of media councils. And <clears throat> 
in that there was a media council in their country and uh, the, the, the response is uh, satisfactory to, to, to the degree of 68% uh, as, a, as an average, uh, but there was still 17% and 13% who didn't know it or, uh, or said, I'm not sure. Uh, so that could mean there, there, there is some work to do uh, within the profession uh, still to, to, to give more visibility to media councils and that va variated between uh, countries and you can check the results in, in, in the reports that actually uh, I, I wanted to say too that these reports will be published on the website this Friday. So if you are interested in, in seeing them, they will be online very soon. Uh, the, what is reassuring is to see, as you see in the second graphic, that uh, overwhelmingly most journalists consider that it's important to have a media council. Uh, another big part of the survey uh, explored the, the, the attitudes of the journalists regarding ethic, ethics in the digital age. Uh, and uh, there was very mixed uh, bag of, of responses, as you see here. Uh, uh, they were evenly split between those who think uh, the code of ethics needs to be rethought and updated to adapt to uh, to to the uh, to the new uh, challenges. Uh, Thirty percent uh, also said that there's no need to to uh, to uh, adapt it, and uh, still another part of the respondents who had a hard time to 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 decide. Uh, and that that is interesting because uh, in terms of men and women, men. Uh, tend to say that the code of ethics is adapted to the digital uh, and ethical challenges more than women, but you see that it's 38 and, and 25. So uh, uh, they, are, they, are, they are still more that feel that maybe it need, needs adaptation or, or they are not sure about it. And uh, regarding the age, those who are more reassured about the validity of the code of ethics uh, uh, nowadays is uh, the the people in their 30s and the people in in their 50s is the young uh, people and 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 people in their in their 40s who are uh, who are more skeptical or uh, have a hard time to 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 position uh, themselves if we look at this similar question from the perspective of the media councils uh, there, uh, they are much more sure that uh, the current code of ethics uh, are responding correctly to the new ethical challenges. Uh, and by countries, uh, you see among the members of these uh, press councils, uh, the, the degree of, of uh, uh, reassurance about, about these uh, various uh, Grayley, Flanders, Wallonia and Germany are, are the ones who are uh, more sure about the adaptations they have done in the in the in the last few years. So, I will, without interruption, pass to the second study, uh, in in the for the sake of of uh, brevity. Uh, and here uh, we focused specifically on young journalists and with a different method. It was not a quantitative study. This was focus groups where, where we gathered uh, forty students from different universities. Uh, here in, in, in the French-speaking uh, part of, of Belgium. Uh, and uh, we will extend this first pilot study to other countries in the second year of, of our project. Uh, the idea was uh, to meet these students and see to what extent ethics is present in, in what ways in, what, in the process of entering uh, the profession. So we interviewed them right after they finished their, their internships, uh, and uh, we wanted to say to see how these, uh, how do they deal with the concept of uh, journalism ethics, and how do, does that shape their professional identity? Uh, the first thing to say is that in in French, there's a, an important distinction between uh, deontology and ethics, and deontology is uh, the concept that defines the set of collective professional standards. Uh, that that uh, regulates the, the profession, and ethics is, has a much more individual and personal uh, connotation. So the students could uh, <clears throat> understand the difference between them, but they tended to blur the, the boundaries, and, 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 and they had very different ways to, 
describe what the ontology and ethics meant for them. But in general, as you see here, the, the words that came in, in the discussion was mainly about uh, something that guides them, somebody, something that is a tool, uh, <clears throat> something that constrains, but at the same time protects uh, their work and uh, that gives credibility. The, the variety of the responses was, was very interesting because they are very close to uh, having learned uh, theoretically that in the school. And despite that, they, they already um, have very different ways to, to, to attach themselves to it. Uh, and the main thing that we found is that for them, the ontology and ethics is a constant negotiation. A negotiation with the, the context around them, their colleagues and their sources, and, and that uh, leads to tensions, as I will explain in a moment. They, they tend to understand that uh, their decisions about ethics are, are, uh, cannot be detached from the editorial identity of the media they were working in, uh, the expectations that are put on them regarding what they need to produce, uh, but also their personal values. So all these different aspects make, uh, make the ontology uh, a process that is uh, a complex negotiation in everyday life for, for the journalists. And that implied for them um, that it's flexible, that, that ethics doesn't have a, a solution that fits all, uh, and that it's deliberative. Uh, it's something that we built uh, in, the, in the process uh, of um, discussing a specific given problems in a specific given moments with a specific given context. Uh, this, of course, leads to tensions, and, and the students were very honest about sharing the anxiousness they have felt in, in, some, uh, in some situations. Uh, the ontology is uh, an object of tension because uh, they don't control all the decisions. And things like the right to privacy, uh, if it's put uh, in, by, in pressure by uh, the profitability and productivity of the media, when the, when the uh, editor-in-chief is asking them, we need to publish this photo because that's gonna generate clicks, uh, that, that makes them uh, realize that making decisions on the ontology is not, is not easy. Uh, and they acknowledge that difficulty. Uh, in their daily practice, then that leads to uh, interactions that can be tense uh, with their peers, editors in chief uh, not, notably, and, but also with their sources uh, in, in, in the context of the relationship of journalists with uh, PR uh, strategies. Um, and being an intern in that context doesn't make it easy because they see themselves uh, as the ones who have less power to defend their ideas or their position in, in the context of unusual. Uh, despite that, they were very, uh, they had very clear ideas about what is good journalism. And they were very judgmental about their own uh, the quality of their work, the, cal the quality of their peers, uh, and, and they expect uh, highest standards in, in the profession. Uh, they actually shared some, uh, uh, some, some uh, étonnement, on dirait en français. Uh, they were appalled by the lack of awareness of the ontological rules by some of their uh, older peers in the, in the newsroom, and that's for, for us was uh, a sign that, that they take the ontology serious. Uh, and even if it's hard for them to define, them, define it uh, clear uh, and to apply it in everyday life, they cherish it and they think it's important. Uh, and, and, it's, uh, and it's one of the core aspects of their, uh, of their, of their identity. Um, finally, we asked them as well, uh, like in the survey, uh, what do you think of the evolution of journalism? And is it a challenge for uh, journalism ethics? They, 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 they are, are agreed that um, it's often hard to find answers in the deontological code to a specific problems that new media is uh, making uh, them uh, face in everyday life, especially social networks. The social media was coming back uh, very recurrently as 
as a place where they had very uh, difficult uh, uh, moments to, to find uh, safe ground uh, in, in, in the ontological quotes. And I think that it's good that in, in the second year of the project, we will devote more attention to, to those challenges. And they perceive this approach, a, a moment of reinvention of the profession. Uh, this, they may perceive the, the norms as more outdated than older colleagues eventually, uh, but they still defend, uh, we need them and we need to, to see how uh, they, they adapt to, to the contemporary challenges. So that was um, some few inputs uh, from, from our, our study here. You see the, the team of uh, people who contributed to do the, these focus groups and to analyze the data and, and uh, Florian Tixier is here uh, in the meeting in case uh, you want to uh, discuss uh, the, the rest of, uh, of, of if you have questions about it. But I invite you to read the full reports uh, on Friday. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. That was a lot of interesting food for thought, um, both on, on the issue of young journalists and the different, I haven't thought about it, different uh, concepts of ethics, deontology, but also about the dealing of, of media councils. I will not repeat it now because we do not have a lot of time. David told me has to leave soon. So are there any immediate questions or comments to those two studies? Then I would like to have them first before we go into a general discussion. Anybody? No. Well, then, um, thank you, David. Thank you a lot. I think um, there's really a lot of interesting stuff we certainly will continue to deal with. Um, I think there are a few people who uh, would like um, to give a general comment. I heard that Adrien uh, from Russia would like to say something. I think Adin, um, who has been following very closely from UNESCO the project, Adin, it would also be great if you say just a few words, the first impressions from project one to two, um, and maybe Peter as well. But first I give the word to our Russian colleague, please. <laughs> Hello, thank you very much. It's a kind of an improvisation. It's just to uh, tell you about the Russian Council, uh, Press Council, uh, that uh, we, uh, uh, together with uh, Nadia Ashgihina, uh, I think most of people uh, here knows her personally, uh, we joined uh, this body really recently and uh, we hope to work uh, within uh, for the uh, upcoming five years and um, uh, it's a, just a short uh, presentation because probably people don't know about the existence of uh, uh, such bodies a real uh, genuine, genuine uh, public organization uh, which uh, consists mainly of very respected members, well-known people, uh, uh, journalists, lawyers, uh, uh, really no, uh, well-known in the professional community. Uh, but um, unfortunately, the uh, activity of this body is mainly the conflict situation touching the uh, ethics, uh, the conflict uh, uh, between, uh, it, it's a kind of compliance, few dozen compliance per year against media. And uh, all this situation are st started in depth uh, and the discussions in, in, of council members is, uh, are, they are very serious and um, lively, uh, uh, anime. Uh, uh, and uh, I can say now, uh, because I assist a uh, few times in this kind of decisions, that uh, all these decisions are made impartial, uh, impartial and correct. Uh, but in unfortunately, the reaction from media in Russia, especially uh, state-owned media, um, when the council decision is directed against them, uh, there's this decision uh, 
uh, they don't appreciate it, it uh, telling so what, uh, what a big deal. I don't know why, probably because of the institution of reputation in Russia is really weak and uh, undeveloped. I don't know. Uh, probably it may be, uh, uh, may have another impact if uh, the council will develop uh, uh, another activities, I think. Not only this activity of uh, uh, judging or uh, taking decision on conflict situation when it's a case of uh, uh, this or another publication, but uh, 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 doing something more important. But now, uh, um, Mikhail Fedotov, uh, who is uh, one of the president of this council, uh, he created the chair, UNESCO chair, on the high school of economics, and I hope um, he he will develop uh, other activities. Uh, because uh, I, I I want to repeat that is really uh, you know, the genuine uh, public body, not governmental body. It's a really important in the present Russia situation. So that, that, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andres. I think it's very important to give an outlook a bit outside of Europe and it also shows if whatever press council can be as good as if it's not embedded in an environment that allows its independence, it's very difficult. And that's why we have to be all very vigilant and of course help you in Russia where we can. So that's been good. Is there any other um, comments? I don't want to force it upon anybody. We are at the end anyway. Adeline, thank you. And then Peter. Hi, everyone. So uh, thanks a lot, Renate. Thanks to everyone for having organized this uh, webinar. Very interesting to hear about all of these results and congratulations for, well, first of all, for the results and second for, for the new year, the new project year two. I think it's really fantastic. As you know, I mean, this is a project for me. Uh, and for those who don't know me, I'm working for UNESCO, uh, for the Brussels office and working for um, the division, um, I mean, for the communication and information sector, working on freedom of expression. And we have long been supporting and promoting media self-regulation um, because of, of course, of its, um, of its benefits in terms of uh, media freedom. And for those who know, it's also like a project that is very close to my heart. Like, I'm really, really happy to see that it's doing, it's, it's doing very well. Um, and I don't want to repeat, I mean, one thing I want to say that for us, what is really important is as well to use this project and this experience in our work in other regions. Um, we are working right now uh, also with the European Federation of Journalists in the Western Balkans, uh, where we do support press councils. And I think this experience that you're gathering, all these, for instance, this presentation about news automations, the need to work on um, on new standards, etc., are really relevant and can be very useful. I also think there is such a need um, for more clarity and information about how press councils are functioning. And I think the results and this new web page, that, I mean website that has been launched with all of this information, is really, really useful. Um, and of course, as always, I have a lot of questions, and I just want to, to keep a few, and I don't know who will be able to, to actually answer. I just want as well to say one thing in relation to what was said with the MEP uh, Giz, uh, in relation to this, um, the Digital Service Act, and also this discussion um, in relation to uh, Social Media Council. Um, um, this is also something at UNESCO that we're following very closely, and we are actually starting a new project um, uh, but it's like it's, it's entitled Social Media for Peace, uh, where we we're planning to to really work with um, uh, social media platform on the monitoring of uh, potential harmful content, and get more insight about how we are actually um, trying to see how to better curb uh, potential harmful content and work with platforms. Uh, but I think the experience of press council promoting self-regulation. Uh, within uh, within the media is extremely relevant and there is always for me one of the big questions is how press councils are dealing uh, with this definition 
of journalism online because I mean when we go to the like there was always some discussion how much press councils are dealing with the with the the content online uh, but then when we go to social media how do you make this distinction between what is journalistic content what is not journalistic content and what is actually the content that should be um, taken over by the by the press councils because uh, it's up to them then or not to decide what, it, what is this journalistic content that they want to take part of. Um, and also for them, um, it's a, it can become a burden. And here I just want to conclude with this because here again, I think for press council that are already under um, difficult financial uh, situation, and this we really need to, 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 to say uh, and, and remind, um, making them as well in charge of, of content that is uh, i mean much more journalistic content potentially uh, be, because that could be on the social media, media platform is also like really really um a complicated uh, uh, area so i wanted to to get a bit more like to hear more a bit from from the press council about what they think about that um and my second question um very quickly is um, in relation to the, in the independence of press and media councils. We had this conversation at the start of the, the first uh, project uh, about what could be and uh, what would be the criteria to actually define uh, better the independence of press and media councils. And I was wondering where we stand um, in that area at the end of year one. Sorry for too many questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Adeline. We should actually start the Zoom now to respond to your <laughs> very good questions, um, which is not possible. But still, I also would like to thank you because you have actually been extremely helpful um, for us toward, throughout the project in, in helping us. And as you rightly say, we have a common project on trust in media in the Balkan. And of course, it's very important to transfer all that knowledge. We have a colleague from Serbia, Dejan, here with us and he certainly agrees with that. Um, before I give the floor to anybody who would like to respond on both this very important issue on what's journalist content and who is dealing with that, the issue of social media, of independence, and indeed something we haven't discussed that, which are the finances, which is very important, and I'm not sure if we have the response here. But maybe Peter Knappen, who has been very active throughout the project as well, and he's from the Flemish part of the press councils. Peter, you can already say a few things towards what Adeline said, and then maybe we have somebody else who is eager to say a few words. Thank you, Adeline, and um, welcome, Peter. Okay, thank you. Uh, the questions of uh, Adeline, uh, I, I would like to mention that we with the Flemish Press Council of Belgium did a comparative study, a comparative survey of uh, 28 or 32, I don't remember, <laughs> press councils uh, around the world and also the results of these of this survey you can find on the website uh, presscouncils.eu. We uh, the survey was about the way that the press councils are organized, that they work, etc. And one of the of the questions was also how can press councils guarantee and prove their independence? It's a very difficult question. Uh, you can see it as financial independence and uh, yeah, of course you need money to work at the press council and by whom who are you who are you financed that's one of, of the questions you have uh, some uh, you have different models uh, press councils financed by media organizations press councils financed by media organizations and journalists journalist associations or partly by subsidies of the government. Um, you can always say when you're financed by media organizations or by the government, there will be influence. All press councils guaranteed uh, in, the, in the study that there is no, there is no uh, kind of influence, sorry. Uh, but I think that the, the most uh, the, the answer that we mostly heard was that you have to prove to prove your uh, your independence in your daily work by the decisions you make about complaints. 
and uh, when people see sometimes people say oh your you will all, always your decisions will always be in favor of uh, the journalists it's not true you can see that it is not true in the decisions of uh, press councils um, about complaints so that's one thing and another thing is that you need i think to prove your independence checks and balances in your organization checks and balances between and that's what uh, uh, the representative of the Greens in Germany already said about self-regulation, for instance, for social media, that in a monopolist situation, it's very difficult to do. But when you have the different competitors, uh, competitive organizations, media organizations in your press council, and you can guarantee checks and balances between journalists, between media organizations, and with also representatives of civil society in the press council, then I think that's also an, uh, uh, an, 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 uh, one thing to guarantee the independence that you have a lot of IDs, a lot of um, points of view in press council that can be discussed. We, for instance, we always decide by consensus in our press council. We have 36 members. You have very small uh, press councils with five, six, seven members who take decisions. But this, I think these two or three things that uh, prove your independence in your daily work, guarantee that you have a lot of, uh, of uh, checks and balances within your press council and be transparent. Transparency and representativeness is I think very important for press councils. You need to be representative for the media landscape in your country. So be inclusive, allow as much as media organizations and uh, media outlets as possible and be transparent in the way you work, in uh, the way you take decisions. And of course, we all do, we publish all our decisions ask the, the media outlets to to um, to publish also your decisions. I think this can be means to prove that you are that you work in an independent way. Um, that could be an answer to the second question uh, of Adeline. How do you define journalism? It's very difficult to define it. We try to do it in our uh, press code uh, in our ethical code uh, but we didn't do it and also that's also one of the of the remarkable results of our uh, survey is that only one or two of the 28 press councils uh, have a definition of journalism in their ethical code or in their statutes and most of them say we decide case by case if, for instance, a publication on social media can be seen as journalism or, or not. Because it's very difficult to define journalism because then you are to, going to exclude some things or to include too much. Then you are going to include all posts of all people on social media and to define it that journalism, then it's, it's, it's impossible to work. So that's the case why uh, most of the press councils that were uh, in our survey say we decide case by case. What when we get complaints about uh, journalism on social media, we decide case by case whether it is journalism or not. And of course, we motivate, uh, we, we, we argue our, uh, our decision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. There were actually some, some great answers to questions from Adeline. As we have Alexandra still here, and she was also, Peter mentioned her, um, would be great to have 30 seconds from you as a final word from the political world. 
Yes, thank, thank you very much. This has been a very interesting event. You probably know that MEPs have packed schedules and I managed to at least listen the whole time. So I think that's, that's proof of the quality of what you're doing here. And I think as an MEP and as a politician, but also as a citizen, I can only reiterate what I said very in the beginning, that we are extremely grateful for your work because our democracy depends on it and therefore never underestimate yourself and what you're doing. The only little thing I would like to, to redraw your attention to is the larger context. And really, um, sorry for repeating myself, but certainly the disinformation problem doesn't come from the dynamics in the traditional media. I mean, they're obviously strongly concerned by it because they can't avoid it and they have to deal with it somehow. But um, what I think we have to look at is the whole landscape of media and social media and how they interact. And just maybe as a, as a very small last remark, um, when, when you were speaking about ethics and deontology, something that came to my mind was a recent study by Alex Fanta and Ingo Dachwitz. I think it's, it's available in German too. I don't know if you know this on the role of Google, for example, in media and how that influences statements also made and content. And this is something that, that I would be very, I don't know, you're probably already looking at that, but I'm looking at that with really huge concern because you know we have a huge battle within the digital services act coming up. And please consider, consider that something that really concerns your work very, very directly. And I would be very, very happy to keep in touch with all of you. And in the meantime, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexander. Excellent. Yes, actually, we had Alex Salafanta, who was representing our report, our, our digital expert group, and there was a lot of interest in that. And of course, there is a need for, for follow up and also regarding the DSA, um, all these issues. So we will be very happy to, to keep in touch with you and with all of you. And I think we are getting to, um, to the end of this, I personally found very, very interesting um, online event with a lot of information that even still has to be digested. A lot of questions which always remain or even come up. And um, I'm very happy that we have this second project where we will deep deeper into the situation. It's true, self-regulation, as I also said at the beginning, cannot be seen independently of everything else. And the challenges are enormous out there, not only disinformation and conspiracy, but a lot of others. And that's why we have to keep doing the work, but why we have to keep outreaching to journalists, first of all, to civil society, to publishers. We need very much as well to keep the, the issue of quality and trustful news up because with the help of the publishers also to invest in that, the work will be even more difficult. So we are also grateful that some of the publishers and media organizations we had here today, and we also had somebody from Stars, Natalie from Stars for Media. We are doing another project where we are trying to, to invest in, in creative, innovative journalistic work, always keeping ethics and trust very much as a criteria for any prize giving um, we, are, we are doing there. So thank you very much, all of you, and hope to see you all soon again. Happy New Year again. I think it's still possible to say that on, on the 11th of January. We all need a bit of luck and um, see you soon. Thank you. And bye-bye.